Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast. What's going on? How are you? I am, uh, once again, this is like all of a sudden, I never have fucking guests, and then all of a sudden, they all come out of the woodwork, almost at the same time, on all musicians. And once again, <laughs> we have a very special guest, uh, Ms. Tal Wilkenfeld. How are you? I'm good. You got a new album coming out. Yep. Right? It just came well, out on you know Friday. What? I didn't even want to start with that because I know you've fucking been talking about all kinds of music. I had to ask you because we're over your place right now. How are you liking the Vitamix? I love the Vitamix. Because I've gotten into like, I'm an old man now. I don't know if you can tell. I use a lot of lotion. You might think <laughs> I'm still in my 20s, but I'm about to turn 51 here in June. And uh, I, I've started to do like for breakfast, I like to just have like a smoothie. Yeah. As phony as that sounds to everybody who doesn't live in, it's the fucking greatest thing ever, right? You just drink it, you're full. Yeah. You know, rather than doing the Denny's Grand Slam breakfast, you feel like a tub of shit, which mm -hmm. makes you eat something else bad. So people have been telling me about the Vitamix. <laughs> and this is where I am in my life right now. I'm like, like, that was the thing. You have all these amazing instruments and shit, and the thing that stuck out was like, oh, a Vitamix. I wonder if that one mashes up the fucking spinach and kale a little bit better. I have the the best recipe too. You do, yeah. Cause I got I got two really good ones that oh, I stand yeah. by. What, what are they? Are they trade. Uh, I got one that uh, I substitute the kale for spinach. Spinach tastes better. All it is okay. is it's just that. Uh, I substitute for dandelion greens. Just FYI. You s with. Dandelion? I use dandelion greens. Now, what do you do to sweeten that up so it's not bitter as shit? I use some honey, just a little bit of honey. Just a little bit. Yeah. I remember one time my wife took me to some restaurant. We ended up eating like dandelions, like a dandelion. <laughs> we were both trying it out like, hey, man, let's be healthy. We both looked at each other. It's like uh, it was one of the worst things I ever tasted. <laughs> so when you grind that up, what do you have, almond milk in there too or something? No, 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 no. Uh, it's, it's actually a juice, really. It's not like a smoothie. Um, but it's quite thick, which is why I still call it a smoothie. But mine has dandelion greens, cilantro, a little bit of black pepper. Oh, my God. Turmeric. Um, ginger, like fresh ginger. Hey, watch what you call me. Right. <laughs> Wait, you stand by that? It's, it, this it's sounds, amazing. It sounds A horrific. little bit of honey. What else do I put in there? Water. There's obviously water. And, and then I get hungry Ooh. an hour and a half later. Where do you buy Danny? Dan, you just go in your backyard and yank them out of the <laughs> fucking grass? Where do, you, where do you get your dandelions? Uh, like any health food store, Whole Foods or wherever. I've never, I got to be honest with you. And I've been to a few of those little health food places. I've never... I've never seen that, but uh, all right. Mine, mine's just simple. It's just a almond. It's uh, almond milk with some almonds, just in case there's not enough almond in there. <laughs> then some spinach. Uh, what the fuck is a banana? A little bit of ice. Um, I know I'm forgetting something. Is there cinnamon? What about in blueberries? There? Do you ever use blueberries? No, I got to get a couple good ones because I, I basically have two go-to smoothies and I'm getting sick of them. And then I have like this Greek yogurt parfait and I just sort of rotate that on a three. And I'm just, mm -hmm. I've had it, you know, you know, like when you've been jamming with people too long, you're like, we need some new blood or something. That's where I am with this is me trying to steer it back to the music here. So let's at least say the name of your incredible album that I only heard three tracks of because I couldn't figure out how to download it. Um, for those of you not familiar with Tal, she's, uh, she's basically played with everybody. And I promised her I wasn't going to bring up all the past, like, hey, man, what was it like playing with this person? But she's, you know, IMDb or she's played with literally everybody. And you've basically been known as this monster bass player that can just play with anybody. And uh, your hidden talent of an unbelievable singing voice is finally displayed. Like, that's what killed me when I listened. You just played those three tracks for me. Aside from, of course, how upfront, you know, the bass is and all the mix, right. which I'm loving. Um, I, yeah, I had no idea you could sing like that. I kind of, um, I, I've kept it quiet for a while. Like I started as a singer songwriter when I first picked up guitar mm -hmm. and then, um, sort of started focusing just on guitar when I moved to America because uh -huh. I left home when I was 16 right. and I moved to America and I, I went to this music school for a little while and, uh, I went from like only being, I hope you went to a nice place. <laughs> With all this crap about the Michael Jackson documentary, which I for, for refuse to fucking watch. Why would you do that? Why would you put all those, that, those horrible stories in your head? It's like, I get it. All right, the guy was a creep, and now he's dead, so... <laughs> what are we doing? I guess you got to list. Somebody's going... Someone was telling me, going, you ha well, you have to watch it, so... Then you, you as a parent, it's like, I'm not going to let some fucking guy sleep with my kid behind nine doors. 
Anyway, so you got this album coming out. <laughs> Sorry. So, so I went to um, <laughs> I went to this this school, and I, I went from being allowed to play like half an hour a day to wanting to practice for like six hours a day. Was that torture for you, considering the way you took? I remember you hear. I watched that interview. You said the first time you you actually played a chord, you got emotional, you cried. Yeah. So you love something that much, and then all of a sudden you go into you go into school. In Australia? Yeah. So they were teaching about Columbus and all the great stuff that happened here in America, <laughs> right, of right. course, right? Um, whatever it was. How you guys, you got dropped off by the English? Is that what happened? <laughs> Something like that. We're a bunch of convicts, apparently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So then all of a sudden, was that torture for you in school? It was just, it was hard because, um, you know, academia was the focus, especially like um, where I, like with who I grew up with, mm -hmm. you know? Um, my mom just like really wanted me to... Uh, you know, Being do all accounted. my, yeah, do all my schoolwork and stuff. I mean, she's probably just being a responsible parent, but like, I just mm -hmm. was not into geography and history. I was into art. So did you ever just like t pick up the bass and be like, mom, listen to this. I mean, listen I to this and then look at my grades in math <laughs> and you tell me which direction I'm supposed to go in. I mean, uh, I was a, just, I was a guitarist at that oh, point. Okay. Like I only switched to bass when I was 17, which, I, and I already moved to America at that point. But yeah, I mean, she heard me play. I just, I think that like, you know, uh, the music business is a tough place and she probably just thought like, uh, oh, you, maybe, maybe that's not the best thing for you to do to be in the music industry. It's so uncertain. I know. Um, so, but I wasn't going to listen to what anyone was going to say. Like that's all I knew that I had to be a musician and I didn't care if I was going to be homeless and, right. and be a musician. I just, I knew that that's what I had to do. So you I ever wonder how many, there's how many musicians are out there because that story is like you had that inner drive hmm. and like, I always wondered like how many like Jimi Hendrix that are like working at Home Depot because their parents or, or some, something, you know, they just didn't have that thing to be like, no, 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 fuck that. I'm doing it. Right. Um, when really important people that basically taught you how to walk and talk and all of that stuff start telling you, you know, you shouldn't go in that direction. Is that just something that you, is, was that something that developed? Was it the love that you had when you started playing guitar that you were like, no, I literally have to do this? Or do you feel you always had sort of that, that, uh, that drive? Well, I actually think... Um, as a kid, especially as a teenager, like if your parents tell you not to do something, you're going to want to do it more right. like 99% of teenagers. I dread those days when my daughter gets <laughs> that age. Okay. Yeah. So it probably worked, uh, uh, out in the, the right way that she didn't really want me to focus on music because that just made me want to do it more. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of, I mean, I wouldn't even say I was necessarily rebellious, but if you want something that bad and someone's telling you no, you're like, yeah. well, I'll prove to you that, that I really deserve this and I'm going to work my ass off. And I did. Like, I was so focused. Like, my rebellion as a, a, a teenager was to succeed as a musician. It wasn't right. like to go off and do drugs or whatever else. Like, that was my rebellion was, was success. You know, I went to, uh, I was looking at schools to see which one to take, you know, put my daughter in, you know, all the public schools are shit out here, I guess. So you got to send them to private school and spend like a zillion dollars by the time they're like eight. It's so fucking stupid. So he went to this one and it was like a French speaking one, right? <clears throat> so all the kids was amazing. The kids were super smart. It was a great school. And, and, but the lady given like the tour, right? She goes, uh, the hell did she say? I asked her, I said, Hey, you know, uh, do the parents kind of learn French along the way? She's like, no, we, we encourage you to speak the perfect English at home and blah, blah. I said, well, what if I, what if I want to learn it too? And she looked at me, she goes, yes, it's too late for you. <laughs> I was just like, God damn. I actually respected it. But you know what? I'm so happy she said that to me because now I got this thing like, all right, I'll show you. Yeah. And I got flashcards. Yeah. I ordered flashcards <laughs> right. and I'm like looking at them. I'm trying to put together <laughs> phrases and stuff. I, you know, listen, the back of my head, I know she's probably right. And I love the school and I'm actually uh, excited that the potential to go there. But like, I, I do relate to that as far as um, when somebody says that. But there was a period in my life where I wasn't that guy. Oh, yeah. Like if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, oh, OK, forget it. Oh, really? So, yeah. yeah. I think I've probably uh, had that since I was really young, like uh, like just determination to do whatever I want to do. Because like I remember being super focused on um, running before I was a guitar player and I was like, mm -hmm. obsessed with long distance running, 
Like, and, and in my head, I'm like, I have to be the best. I have to be the best runner. The gold and there was this one girl that was better than me. And, and it pissed me off so much. And <laughs> I remember like, there was this one race that was, I don't know, it was like a 10 mile race. It was really long. And, and I just, I just had to beat this girl. And I did beat the girl. You did. But I did this like, um, like celebratory dance afterwards because I was so excited and I threw my back out. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So then I, I, I kind of was like hobbling around for a little while and couldn't run like a couple of weeks. And then that's actually when I walked past that guitar and, and started playing guitar. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, did she uh, get like, mad when you did that dance? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think she saw it. She was that far behind me. <laughs> wow. That's like a feel good movie, except they, they always run credits before you blow out your back. <laughs> Then you became like a musician. So, you know, the the few tracks that I heard in the three, the, the three that I listened to was definitely, you know, this is really like a very personal album as far as like, you know, talking about yourself. That, that one you just played, what was the name? Uh, uh, the Haunted Heart? Oh, uh, Haunted Love. Haunted Love. The one that's just the bass and voice, with the orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, some pretty uh, heavy lyrics that made me start thinking about my parents I went on a little trip there when oh, I was, yeah. yeah, yeah, thinking about my whole life. And um, I, for people listening here, I, I can't recommend like the level of quality of, of the music that you've, you've done with other people. And now to actually hear, hey, these are my ideas with your voice on top of it. Uh, the second I heard a few of these, I was like, oh, this is one of these, these albums I'm just going to put in. Back in the day when you had a CD, just stick it in there until the thing just uh, started skipping on you. <laughs> but um, You um, mean how your iTunes is skipping on you right now? You like well, have 30 my, seconds. Of I the know. Same song I, I'm over the, and over I am again. the worst. I'm the worst. People are like, oh, you can download it. You got Spotify. It's like, I don't have Spotify. I, I'm, I'm this idiot who I still buy music and then it fills up your computer. And now, because right now I need a new, I need a new laptop. I need a new phone and I need yeah. a new iPad, iPad. The whole thing's shitting the bed on me at the same time. And uh, yeah, I miss. Can I buy it on vinyl? I yeah, have a, I have you a record can. player. You can. Yes. I'll, I'll even give it to you on vinyl. <laughs> they don't need to do that. You already got me a burrito here from coming over, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll throw some money towards that. But um, what was I going to say? So you also mentioned that you're actually going to be doing a whole tour on this thing too, huh? Yeah. Now, are you headlining tour? Are you opening? What are yeah, you doing? Yeah, headlining. Headlining. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Nice. I'm going to Boston. Is this your first like big headlining tour? Because you've always been like the hired gun. Um, as far as I know, um, yeah. this is your first, like, um, well, I, I actually, I was opening for the who with my band, mm -hmm. um, and we played the Boston garden and some really cool, is it called the Boston garden? Or? Uh, they called the TD bank North TD garden. garden. The key, how'd you like that? That I, was fun. Yeah. Didn't you do that recently? Uh, yeah, I did some stand up there. Yeah. And I did jam before with my brothers. That's so cool. Uh, we had a good, yeah, we definitely had, uh. You know, what's so funny is we, uh, every, no one was paying attention at all when we were playing or whatever. They thought it was kind of funny that we were doing it. And there's this comedian, uh, Jim Brewer, mm -hmm. who does this amazing bit on Slayer fans, like how dedicated and crazy they are. Well, we actually played, I forget what song we played. We played a Slayer song. And literally, this, it was like no one was reacting to anything we were doing. We suck, right? The second we started playing Slayer, some fucking security guy, like, you know, halfway up the arena, just goes, Slayer! That <laughs> 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 was hilarious. So. Um, now your does style that, of music, like going, no, you're going to ask me something. No, right? I was going to say like, like what does playing before a stand up set do for you? It makes the, the venue not as intimidating. I've only done it at like, when why, I, when I, why does because it do? you know, it stand up in a place that big doesn't make sense. Uh -huh. You're like, how you know, I, I, I had all these feelings of like, why am I, uh, like, how did I get here? What am I doing here? What the fuck do I have to say that justifies all these people showing up? You know, the normal, if you're any sort of like human being, that's what you have. If you're a psychopath, you're just like, yeah. well, how come I'm not playing the football stadium or whatever, you know, or we're playing the Roman Coliseum. But I, yeah, I was sitting there and uh, that's, that what was what was going through my head. But um, the first time I ever did one, I did for the New York Comedy Festival and I did Madison Square Garden. And uh, we got together and jammed in there. And I just did that because I love Led Zeppelin and they did Song Remains the same. I, I could just play some drums there and make a little bit of noise. And what happened was we were having so much fun and I invited so many people down there that I, you know, I didn't ever fully forget where I was. But next thing you know, you know, I was yelling, hey, Josh, how does that, that Motley Crue thing? And you're just, you're just yelling and you, you just kind of made it yours. Yeah. So... That night, it just didn't, it didn't feel, um, 
I was able to kind of just like, I had already made a bunch of noise in there and nothing bad happened, you know, it not, the roof didn't collapse. So I think that that's kind of like what it uh, did for me. Although I fucked up at the forum because I played it like three hours. I almost fucked up because I was just like, I got off stage and I was like wiped out. I was just like, oh, oh no. Yeah. Oh, no. But then, like, the adrenaline is like, oh, my God, what if I bomb in from all these fucking people? You know, that, that'll get you through a good 90 minutes. But why do you not, like, play on stage for your audience? Because I respect them. Ah, <laughs> you're a great drummer. I don't know why you say that. Uh, I'm good for a comedian. I'll give you that. No, but I am I, not I like a, because, you know what, I, I like, uh, like, one of my favorite things to do is to watch a pro play Mm -hmm. because it's just you know when they're just doing like a sound check a lot of times they'll be physically playing something that i could play but i could never make it sound like that and there's always like a person you know if you listen to a really good drummer you can hear like you can hear them in the playing Mm -hmm. which um you know took me a while to be able to hear that but uh now i'm able to do and i've 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 seen i don't know there's just something cool about it it's like watching a professional hockey player like taping up their stick there's just something when you see a pro doing something um it's and you're into it especially if it's your hobby it's fucking mesmerizing so that's that's why when a few times i've come over here like i'm always in there because i like sitting back and just watching all of you guys play and um my favorite thing about watching a live band is watching a band that doesn't play it the same way every night and, you, and even if you've never seen the band you can tell because they're like looking at each other and everything so that's when i get into like oh man they're in the moment right now this is like watching a comic riff and somebody's going to do something make somebody smile and then they add something else and i and just as an audience member and a fan of music trying to pick up like that thing going on and um like my I, in turn like i'm the, the bands i listened to growing up like i remember stevie ray vaughn whenever he was playing a solo it was like chris layton and tommy shannon and reese were always looking right at him like is he gonna go back in again oh we going we going back to you know him singing and he just would fucking be wailing and he had this little thing you just look at him he just give him a little nod and how they all were like okay and 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 it, they wouldn't fuck that up um just having attempted to you know get together with friends and play and everything i just i've i have such an uh, admiration for it so um i, I mean that's how i feel about comedy and great comedy and that's why i like watching you perform oh yeah when i do a great shit joke and i i I nod over to somebody who just did a dick joke yeah man it's amazing (laughs) it's 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 right on the same level no but like because i just started as you know like getting it really heavily into comedy the past like year or so yeah and like the reason it appeals to me so much is because it like speaks to both parts of me as a musician there's the uh the jazz musician in me, which is like the improvisational musician, which like, like really enjoys watching you riff, like, and and just, and then there's like, (laughs) and then there's like the composer, like the, the person that's like, you know, into writing songs and like, and then watching you create this amazing material. So it's, it's, it's very satisfying. Is that a requirement for people in your band? Cause I mean, when you, like when you go and do this tour, like, uh, I, I, I just know th- doing the same jokes over and over and over again. It's like you have to, like, yeah. do something to break out of it. Do you, um, on this tour, I mean, you're selling the album. You got to go out and, 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 you know, play it and sell the music to them. Like, how uh, how much, like, messing around do you do? I do, s- I do a lot, and then it is a requirement. And that's why it's been really tricky to find band members. And I have found, like, the perfect... Um, guitarist and drummer to play mm-hmm. with me because, you know, my music is, uh, compositionally, um, like lyrically, for instance, very influenced by folk music or just songwriter music. But then musically it's, um, it, it's influenced from anything from rock to folk to jazz to whatever. It just goes all over the place. That's musically. what I was loving. But there's, there's some sort of through line. Maybe it's you. I don't know what it is on it because I was just listening to it and it sounded so great. And then I, I really started listening to the mix of it. I'm like, wow, she's the whole bottom end of this song. And then it felt, I don't know how to say it technically, but it felt like the guitars and keys were like up here. Yeah. And But you were the sort of the meat and potatoes of the whole thing driving the whole song. But like the, uh, the different tones and stuff... Um, there was one. I don't know, I'm, I'm the worst. I don't know the names of the corner song, painter. But, the first well, one. Yeah, oh, when you went me. into that bridge, it was or, or is that what the section's called? That middle section. It's just like, what the fuck is that? And then you go right back to that part that really rocks. Oh yeah, corner That's painter. when I looked at you. I was just like, that's when the crowd's gonna go nuts because uh, you're taking them on this ride where you're coming out and you're just 
you know, blowing their wig back in the beginning. And then it goes <laughs> to this other place. It's like, whoa, what the fuck is this? This is this mood thing. Well, that's where it's like, hey, if people start taking their drugs in the crowd, I would feel. <laughs> and <laughs> look, at, I went. Maybe I went, that's what you'll be doing. <laughs> no, that's dude. I grew up going to heavy metal yeah, concerts. Yeah. That was the time all of a sudden somebody like sparked up a fucking J, as we used to say. And uh, and then all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, you just punch him in the face again, and then the fucking song is over. It's just like, yeah. Um, I think that the cohesiveness um, on the record comes from like having the same band play all of these songs, even though they're they're very different. Like right. some are, you know, just vocal and bass and some are acoustic guitar and and very uh, little uh, behind me and then there's like these full rockers but it's the same band and I just think that that's really important like for how long does it take you to put that together well it took me a few years to sort of search for the sound of the record right and like figure out who was going to play on it and who who like what was the, the the best sound for these songs and then I finally went uh, into the studio with uh, Blake Mills and Jeremy and Paul Stacy, and uh, we cut Corner Painter, which is the mm. first song I played you, and it's the first song on the record. And that, when I heard that back on the speakers, and this was no bass, it was just, I was playing acoustic baritone guitar, Blake was playing guitar, and Jeremy was playing drums, and the sound was so full. Right. Like, I didn't even want to play bass on it. There's no bass on that song at all. I just played it on an organ, and then Ben Montench overdubbed uh, organ as well, like a pump organ. Mm -hmm. But I heard that song. I was like, this is the linchpin for the record. And so then I went home and I like wrote a bunch of other songs that I felt would fit with that vibe or complement it. And and then once I'd done that, we went back in the studio for, it was like anywhere from like eight to 10 days and cut the whole thing at once. Wow. And so I think that that's part of the, the cohesiveness is that we just, we cut it all together. Hey, when you put together a band, have you ever had been like, okay, I know these two people are right. And then a third person comes in and so takes it into another direction. You got to fire one of those other two people. <laughs> they're just, because, but the other, because the other person's such a beast. I mean, it's all, it's all about. Chemistry. Notice how I pointed at the drums yeah, when I said you're that. Right. No, it's it's all about chemistry. It's like casting for a movie too. Like sometimes it's the most important thing is the casting. All right. How do you like LA, by the way? Do you miss Australia? Um, I don't miss Australia. Um, some of my best friends are there. I, I definitely miss them, you know. Mm -hmm. But and I miss the beach. I don't really think that the beach in LA is that cool. No, I gotta be. I'm terrified of the ocean, and but every time I go to Australia, it's like I if I was ever, you know, there's a place to get eaten by a shark. It is definitely the coast right. of your country. It's so beautiful. You'd be at yeah. least well. At least I was, you yeah. know. At least you'd die beautifully. Yeah, no, I, I remember it was we were there in like uh, I don't know when we were. It was your your weird winter down there, which is just a different time, and it was too it was too cold and windy. Um, it's not weird. It's just weird to me because I'm in the Northern Hemisphere. But so we were down there and I was expecting it to be fucking hot. And all of a sudden it was like freezing. And, uh, but I, even then I was looking at it. I was like, if it wasn't so rough and it wasn't so cold, I think I would maybe, I did actually go into the water when I was in Perth because I just wanted to say that I stood in the Indian Ocean. Right? <laughs> I literally went up to my ankles and then I got back in and then I got in the car and I was listening to the radio and there was a helicopter following like an 18 foot tiger shark along the beach just to let the surfers and everybody know that the thing was there. And you guys have the creepiest terminology ever for when someone gets eaten by a shark. You say he was taken. <laughs> That's what I heard. Oh, oh yeah, it was some blah, blah, blah. He got taken. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be eaten than taken. Eaten to me is it's over. I mean, it's fucking horrific, and then I, you bleed out, and it's over. Taken means I, I, you, you, you took me somewhere. <laughs> I just start thinking of Chainsaw Massacre when that fucking guy just grabbed that woman and yanked her in and slammed the door. Take, so, taken almost sounds slightly more polite, though. No? Taken? No. Well, I guess what the next word is. Taken uh, to the movies. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> taken to the uh, fucking. Oh I've my been taken God. to the movies by some sharks. <laughs> oh, yeah? I was going to say, you know, it seems, uh, you know what I liked? It's, there's fair play on this album. Yeah. As far as uh, there was a few where it was the other person and there was a few that was you. Right. So that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's an important milestone in your life. When you, uh, at least for me, it was when I was able to be like, all right. You know, I was going through that. Dude, chicks are fucking psychos. You know, right. I did that till I was about 35 and I was just like, all right, Phil, 
you know, at what point are you going to fucking, is it maybe you, maybe who you're picking, maybe what you're bringing to the table? And then once I was able to do that, I finally ended up meeting Nia. I, that's kind of why I called the album Love Remains, because Love Remains, as in the remnants of love, like the aftermath of, of a love gone bad, or Love Remains, like love still exists oh, it still through exists. it all. Oh, I thought you meant there was still pieces of other relationships in you. It's, it's both. It's like the remnants, and then the love still you know, continues. There's always love. Well, this is theory among my guy friends that women are able to cry it out because you're allowed to cry, that you're able to get past shit, and then it's just like fucking gone, where guys like hang on to shit. I mean, I was reading this book on Bob Cousy. He's one of the great Celtics, and Bill Russell, right? One of the greatest players of all time. And Bob Cousy's wife passed away, and he still has a picture on the wall, and he still talks to her. Well, I guess they didn't break up, so maybe it was that, but like... You know, I used to always joke with my wife going, you know, if I died within three weeks, you'd have all my clothes down at Goodwill. (laughs) 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 You keep maybe a DVD in the back of a fucking closet, which she's like, no, I would never do that. But I just feel like women are better at uh, either how you're wired. And then I also think it's more it's uh, one of the great emotions crying one of the great healing emotions is not acceptable for guys and you just shut it off so not only do you not get to heal you actually make yourself i think worse by fucking uh holding it in it's bad enough you know i don't know it's it's a really uh weird thing so uh, that's that's actually i don't i don't know what the word is but to hear you say that 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 you actually uh some of it stays in there i don't know that makes me feel not as fucked up (laughs) well also like i i feel like when when you're in love or when you love someone, like it, people often like project it outwards as if it's the other person that's making you in love. Whereas mm-hmm. like love is actually just always in you, and that that person is is maybe igniting it or or showing you that it's there. But it it is always there, and right. knowing that keeps me centered. Yeah, it's 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 that's not something that you can. It's hard to remember that, you know. I would, I would say, I don't know. I'm actually literally getting uncomfortable just even talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. Like, no, I'm, I, I'm, I was walled off for a long fucking time. And then I, I had like this massive amount of love in me and it would just come out in these weird ways, <laughs> like about like, like uh, animals being abused or any sort of person being hurt. I could feel it, but like if I was just with somebody and we're going to the movies, like I didn't even know what the fuck to do. I'd just be sitting there like this fucking robot, like, did you enjoy that? Now we're getting on the subway. And it was just like, and I was meeting people. I, I just, oh, I, I don't even, I, I'm embarrassed at the, where the kind of person I was back in the day as far as like trying to get through stuff like that. But, but how did you break through that? I met somebody I couldn't break up with. Uh. <laughs> I would, in my head, fantasize during tough times of breaking up with my now wife. And in my head, we were living in this place where there was, there was the first place was an elevator and the other place had stairs. And when she was going to get on the elevator, even in the fantasy of being single again, before the door closed, I would run out and go get her. Or when she would walk down the stairs, I'd, all right, all right, come back in. Like I couldn't, I couldn't even, and, and for years I did yeah. that. And it never dawned on me. Like I've always been so fucking like not in touch with like, hey, Bill, you know, this is the 20,000th f- fucking signal. Like I used to ride around, I had a paper route back in the day and I used to ride around in the morning and I had memorized comedy routines of my favorite comedians and I would fantasize that I was doing them in front of the school and it didn't dawn on me at that point. Hey, Bill, maybe you want to be a comedian. It didn't. It was just, I had no connection to it whatsoever. Huh. It was just me. I think at that point it was all about, you know, getting people to like me so I wouldn't get the shit kicked out of me or I wouldn't have to deal with some, you know, you know, you know, it was it was before all this caring (laughs) on social media. It's just like the the whole every day at school is just like, am I going to get it today or or how can I get it off of me and get it onto the next week as kid? It was a very weird. um, I don't know. Some of it was good, but a lot of it wasn't. necessarily probably the way kids should grow up now we're probably like overly doing it i don't know you don't make me feel good when you came when i came into your place here and you were like oh there's my phone 
Uh, you lose your, I lose my phone all yeah. the time. Oh, my gosh. You have massive ADD? I, I, I also, unfortunately, uh, get phone anxiety, which I, I hate. Like, which is, oh, well, oh, you don't have it, right? Yeah, if I don't have it, I start to, like, feel like, oh, shit, where's the phone? Or, like, if I don't look at it for, for, for too long, I start to feel that. And so I, I have to work really hard at, like, disciplining myself so that I can, like, keep it away from me for a certain amount of hours to be, like, creative and productive. Because yeah. it's just, pro like, I feel so sorry for, like, for kids that are, like, teenagers right now. Like, they're just, like so attached to their phones and I see what it does to my brain. Teenager, I am. That was brutal. Yeah, no, it like gives you the shortest attention span. It like, everything's just immediate. And so I'm just so glad that like, uh, it kind of came a little bit later. Well, you me. realize we're like lab rats because we're like sort of the first wave right. of like, well, let's see what this does to people. I actually saw, you know, I went and I got gas today and I saw this. After the burrito? Or? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's going to be later. That's why this podcast will not be a full hour. Whenever the, You'll know what's hitting me. What the fuck is on the microphone? Is that a hair? It's going to drive me nuts. Piece of fuzz. Um, so I went up to... It's still there. See? This is the podcast people are used to. Get the... Um, so I pulled up to get... I was getting pumping gas, and, you know, this L.A. couple pulls up. L.A. meaning beautiful. I'm not judging them like they're assholes. They're fucking beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So they pull up and the guy gets out to pump the gas. The woman's driving. The second she barely pressed park, you know, the, immediately the phone and was just sitting there. Uh. And I was watching her and I was just like, that's me. That is literally me. I do that when I'm driving like a lot. I, no, I'm it's fucking everyone. terrible at it. It's, it's yeah. I, I called a friend up one time. This was maybe about three months ago, I was trying to do like an intense period of writing. And I said, hey, could you, just cause I'm, you know, it takes like, I think apparently 28 days to break a habit. I was like, mm. could you come over for, you know, a 28 few day, days, apparently. <laughs> I was like, could you, can I give you my phone and then just go away and then I'll meet you back here. <laughs> and, and I did that for a few days and it actually like helped me like reprogram myself. Oh yeah. Yeah. And like, once you do that, then it's like, ah, oh. You, you feel like you can finally relax. It's weird. This is something that I learned going yeah. overseas and I can't get texts from anybody. This is what happens. If you don't text anybody, nobody texts you. Like I would come back thinking, oh my God, I haven't checked my text messages in 10 days. <laughs> I'm going to have 5 million fucking texts. And I had like maybe six, really? seven. Yeah. I don't, what am I, a loser? Nobody like, it's like <laughs> if I don't text people, you're like, no, I come back to a zillion of them. Now I feel like an yeah. asshole. No, I came back and it's just like... You, uh, it's, it's like, you know, like once you want something in your life not to happen mm -hmm. and you don't realize how right. much of it you're creating. Yeah. Okay. Well, so much of the phone shit, I realize I am creating all of the texting that I'm doing. Like I'm in traffic. Traffic sucks. I just start calling people. Right. I'm right. just like, Hey man, what's going on? I'm stuck <laughs> on the phone. Like I literally have a friend of mine that we, like we, our friendship, cause she's married with kids and I'm married and I have a kid and it's just like. Our whole relationship, I don't think I've seen her in a year and a half. Our whole relationship that we have, the deal, the un, unwritten deal is that we call each other when we're stuck in traffic. Yeah. And the big joke is, hey, I'm on the 134. Right, right. Hey, I'm what on the 101. On? Yep. Yeah. And then that's, and, or the other person picks up. All right, where are you? How long a drive do you have? And it's just like you're sort of almost like a suicide hotline, I like get, talking I, them to get home. I do like all of my phone calls in the car too, or um, really, really late at night, like while I'm getting ready for bed. Like, mm -hmm. like my friends in Australia just know that I'm going to call like 3 a.m. my time, like FaceTiming them while I'm like brushing my teeth and shit. Hilarious. And now it's like a ritual, like, oh, are we ready for teeth brushing time, Tom? <laughs> And what is it like seven the next day there, right? Uh, seven yeah. at night, 14 or, hours? Or even slightly. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Around, around about then. It's great. Like I, I always call Australia at that time when I'm getting ready for bed. Like, was I don't the, have was, much time. When like, was the last time you heard some music that, that made you, uh, like whenever I listen to like amazing music, I always fantasize that it's me doing it. Oh yeah. 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 I do that. No, and all the way through the song, if the drums are awesome, I'm playing drums, someone's singing great. Then all of a sudden I'm doing that. I'm very self-involved. When was the last time you as a musician listened to something and you were just like, ah, oh, fuck, I wish that was me. Does that happen? I don't, no, it doesn't happen. But Strike two with the texting and now the <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> the fantasizing. I don't do that. But I, I, I listen and admire a lot of people. Who did you listen to coming up? 
I didn't want to ask you any of these questions. I know you've been asked this many <laughs> times. Like, fuck, I listened to Miles Davis. And then, of course, there was the Bee Gees, <laughs> jazz, disco. I just You know what I'm really eclectic. obsessed with is, is Indian classical music. Do you remember that time we were, like, driving back from one of your shows and I played you some Indian, Indian classical music? I played no, you. No, I remember we were, me and me I, and Josh I played, were I played singing Bob, some song. I played a Bob Dylan song to you, which you really didn't like, or you were making fun of. But Bob Dylan is like one of my favorites of all time. I love Bob Dylan. Okay, but like you were like joking around, like changing the lyrics and stuff. I was just being an asshole. I was no, being I know, just but it was comedians. It, you, we do that all the yeah, time. Yeah, no, but you made me laugh so much. Oh, when, okay. When we, when, and then I played you an Indian classical piece, but maybe you don't remember that. But what I no, I remember you played me that blues song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was Blind Willie Johnson. Yes. Also one of my faves. Yes, okay. Yeah. That I remember. Yeah. I love old blues. Like, it's so raw and real. Right. And I also like, like, because if you, you'll notice, like, on my album, like, I switch in and out of, like, time signatures a lot, and but it doesn't sound like I'm switching time signatures. At least that's Did what I've been told. Did you do that on the, the things that I, I was? Yeah. I didn't really notice that. But that's what I'm saying, like, because I kind of, I let the music... Um, like the melody or the story guide the time mm -hmm. as opposed to like the other way around. Like a, sometimes people will write uh, the music first and then they lay the melody and stuff on top. Oh, I saw an interview with somebody said that. It said every time I come on with a riff, it's in a weird time signature and then the drummer fixes it. Uh, and I remember thinking like, you should have fucking kept it. Right. In that. Yeah. But what like, the fuck do I know? Like, but I'm just saying that's, that's what I, that's what I would think. Yeah. Like I was joking around like with, uh, with Bob Weir because like basically he he played with Lightning Hopkins. Is he a comedian? Bob Weir, yeah. No I'm kidding. <laughs> Grateful Dead, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Now, he played with Lightning Hopkins, who's one of my favorite, like, blues players. And, um, and I know said, when he started, like, those guys were all, like, in their 40s, yeah. right? Yeah. And, the blues guys, I mean. And, and he, he was joking around, like, saying that, like, Lightning played, like, the 12 and a half bar blues. Because, you know, if he has to add a beat to finish the, the story he's telling, then he's going to add a beat. Like, right. it's not about, like... Just this rigid thing. And like I was I've been composing like that, too. Like if the melody wants to go on a few beats longer or, you know, then make it a bar of seven. Like and it will feel natural if if it goes with the melody. But if you try to fit a melody over the top of a time signature, then sometimes it can feel a little bit more um, choppy. Yeah. Oh, I get that. Yeah. Because then if because the, to the lay person, they're not listening what time it's in. No, they're, they're just listening. following the melody and the story. And it's the same with, like, all that old folk music, too. Like, you listen to some of that old folk, like, you hear, like, bars of five and seven because they're just adding beats to, like, finish the phrase. Yeah, I, ne I never noticed. And that's sometimes why, like, you know, th there won't be drums on it. Like, if there was drums, it, it probably would sound kind of strange. Mm -hmm. But it's just, like, an acoustic guitar and a voice. Like, that song I played for you, that Bob Dylan song, it's called It's All Right, Mom, Any Bleeding. Mm -hmm. Like, there's some bars of, like, five and shit in there. He just, like, adds some beats and it's... You, would, you wouldn't know it. But if you counted it, it's odd because he's just trying to fit the lyric in. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's genius. I love it. So how, 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 I don't know. You're so talented in that area. Like when, when, did, when did you notice that shit? Like I would just be like, I'm just psyched if I listen to a song I know all the words. <laughs> I wouldn't be like, oh, that was just in seven. <laughs> when I first like moved to America and I was playing um, guitar, I, and I was like starting to play like six hours a day and I like gave myself a tendonitis and I had to stop playing for a minute. And then I started like, like messing around like with drums with one hand or like bass with one hand. And people started coming up to me being like, yeah, Mini Vinny, Mini Vinny. And I'm like, what the fuck is Mini Vinny? Like, you know, Vinny Kaliuta. Uh, uh, okay. So I went and like listened to Vinny Kaliuta. Mm -hmm. This was me at, I guess like 17 now. And, uh, and everyone was passing around tapes of, of Vinny Kaliuta, like right. all like the stuff with charisma and um, just a bunch Day. of other stuff. And uh, and actually, Vinny was then one of the first people I met when when I moved to America because he came to my school and I'd been playing for two and a half months at the time. And like one of the, the these drum clinicians was friends with him. Wait a minute, you don't even play two and a half months, and somebody told you to move to. No, US? bass, bass, because I've been playing oh, guitar for a couple oh, years. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. And what was that like? And he was like, oh, we should play sometime. I said, yeah, and I was so shy, like, because I'd listened to all of his stuff, and obviously he's, he's one of the best in the world. 
And I was, but I kept it in my head. I'm like, okay, okay. But then I moved to New York and I'm like, I just want to be a jazz musician. I want to like play in clubs like five times a night and like Charlie Parker and right. Monk and all the guys did. Right. And, and I did that for a few years. And then that's when I like, I, I uh, played with the Almond Brothers and like made a record. Of, you like, played with the Almond Brothers? That was my first gig when I was a teenager. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. Like that's where it all started. And then I came back to LA and I like played Vinny this stuff with the Alma Brothers in my, um, my solo project. And, uh, and then the weeks later he got the call from Jeff Beck that like, or he, Jeff Beck's management that they needed a bass player. And then he, he told them about me and then they called me and they asked me to send in tapes. I sent in the tapes. And the next thing I knew I was flying to England to audition for Jeff so and then everything like you know Prince and Herbie how, how old were you uh I think I was 21 when I started playing with Jeff yeah. Jesus Christ that's the first time I saw you was right. when that live at Ronnie Scott's which I've still never been in there the couple times I've gone to London I oh, always yeah. see it it's always like packed I'm like I don't fucking want to go in there and just yeah have a drink and actually listen to some music for like two seconds that's the first time I saw you so were you nervous when you went into the audition um well I was food poisoned I okay. just got enough a plane like where uh, me and Vinny went to the airport and I <laughs> ate some barbecue chicken pizza and I got on the plane and Vinny's like raving on about politics because he's obsessed with politics. And I'm like, hey, uh, Vinny, I'm feeling kind of sick. And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah. And so then this happened. And that, and that. He, you yeah. know, I mean, he kind of reminds me of you and you remind me of him. It's I think funny. he was from uh, he's from like Pennsylvania. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh no. He, yeah. Yeah. He, Pittsburgh. Oh, he's from Pittsburgh. Yeah. Oh, he's a Pittsburgh guy. Yeah. Oh, but he went to Berkeley. That's why. I knew there was some sort of Massachusetts right, connection right. there. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, he's going on about politics. And then meanwhile, I just like throw up in a bag. And I'm like, there it is. He's like, there what is? I'm like, I'll see you in 10 hours. And I was so sick that like then I had to like get rushed to the oh hospital when we landed and like be on a drip. And then the next day I auditioned for Jeff. And so I was feeling really weird. But um, talk it, about the worst fucking place to get food poisoning. <laughs> totally. Oh, my God. But, they, but the audition went well, because at that point I was so like woozy that I was just like, OK, let's get through this. <laughs> yeah. And, and then that was the point where like Jeff pointed to me and said solo on Cause We've Ended as Lovers. And like he ended up loving that so much that he like kept it in the set. And that's how he was like featuring me every night. Oh, wow. Was, and that's how that which whole, is that so song. like uh, cool of him. Totally. Considering who he is and all of that stuff, yeah. to, to like, uh, I love um, when people do stuff like that. There's a lot of comedians that I, you know, um, that I'm a fan of. But what really makes me, you know, over the top is when I see them like encouraging and helping out, you know, p comics that are coming up. Because I, I hate that fucking thing of, uh, you, you know, that behavior. People yeah. get to a certain level and then they start treating, you know. I don't know, I'm here and you're there. It's all stupid. It's just like, it's, you know. No, you're, even, you're great like that, like the way that you kind of mentor younger comedians. I mean, I, I try not to be in it. I mean, I remember most people were nice, but I definitely remember the, the one, people who weren't. Oh not gosh. necessarily the names, but I just remember how that made me feel. So it's, it's sort of the same thing, too, um, with being like a parent and stuff. I remember the good days at school and I remember the bad days. So I yeah. remember how much fun it was playing with the other kids at school. And then I also remember how bad it was if, you know, you wore the wrong shirt or whatever. And it's just, it was just your day to take the pounding and just like how you could just literally begin. And you know, that was literally like your world. And that's something that I'm hoping I'm going to be able to remember, um, which I think I will as, as my, my kids going through school as far as uh, knowing that though, I mean, those days. I mean, who the hell knows with all the fucking cameras out there? I don't know if you get away with anything. My buddy was just telling me, you know, some, he told this story where there was some kid, everybody picked on that day. And then the kids who picked on him, they found out who all of them were and they had to go see the fucking psychologist and shit. And I was really thinking about that. I was just like, wow, man, like nobody, like there was none of that at all. Mm -hmm. Like the guidance counselor was just some weirdo down the hall. And he would just, he just would talk to, I mean, he would only really talk to kids who had no hope of going to college. Right. And he'd just be down there like, well, hey man, you know, like maybe uh, you get into construction, you know? <laughs> I mean, I never even talked to him, but I just, I don't know what he talked to him about. Maybe their home lives and shit. Maybe it was like a therapy thing, but like only the fucked up kids 
got guidance. Right. It was weird. Right. Everybody else was just like, all right, you're, you're following the cattle right over the fucking cliff. Go to school, two years of language, get into college, pick a major, decide what the fuck you want to do at 18. And then it, yeah, it was one of those things. And, um, I remember when I was 15, um, there was like this like woman that came to the school that was supposedly like a career counselor. Oh, God. And she came with this huge book that looked like yellow pages or something, right? And everyone had to have an appointment. And, and you'd go in and she'd be like, okay, so now what do you want to do? And like someone would be like, I want to be a Get the a fuck doctor. out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, open up the book and she'd look under the doctor. And, and so I walked in. She's like, so what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to be a musician. And she's like, sorry, there's no musician here. What, what else would you like to do? I just walked out. Oh, you walked out? <laughs> yeah. What did she do? I don't know. That was it. <laughs> I would have been, yeah, I would have had like an epiphany being like, wow, I mean, how many of these fucking kids wanted to do something that's not in this book? Right. Yeah, but then you have to look at her, it's just like, there's no way that was her dream in life <laughs> to have a yellow book and talk to people half your age. What do you want to do? I want to be a zookeeper. All right, let's get to the Z's. All right. Do you have any khaki shorts? <laughs> <laughs> so you literally have somebody who didn't follow a dream talking you out of yours and you had the strength to fucking walk away from that. That's very, very commendable. So that's the, those are the moments in life that haunt me that I think right. back into my life when somebody said something negative and thank God, you know, I, I didn't latch onto it totally. And somebody else like, cause I, I have like, I have like, there's like three like moments in my life, you know, like climbing up a uh, fucking cliff that if, if I went to go this way, I would have fell back down. And, and just the luck of it. Mm. Sometimes when I think of it, like, God, what if I didn't meet this person? You know, and I mean, I worked with this guy in a warehouse and I finally found somebody that was into comedy the way I was. And he understood that you could become it. You know what I mean? Right. Like he was going like, dude, these guys on TV are not funny, man. One of these days I'm going to take a shot at Jack Daniels and just go on stage and do it. And all of a sudden, like, cause it just, you know, it was on TV. That was like a million miles away. There was no fucking internet or anything. And, uh, we had, nobody had video cameras, nothing. So it just seemed impossible. Didn't it was so impossible. It didn't even seem impossible. Didn't even, I didn't even enter my brain. It'd be like fucking going to the moon. And all of a sudden he was just next to me going, I'm going to fucking do it. And I was just thinking like, well, shit, if he can try it, I'm going to try it. So uh, if I don't run into him and if he doesn't have the balls to say I'm going to try it, then I'm just fucking hanging out with other knuckleheads like me drinking. Then then all of a sudden I'm 30 and where the fuck am I, you know? So. But do you believe like in like a destiny? Like, do you believe that if that wouldn't have happened, something else would have happened? Or do you believe like it? Was I don't believe in destiny because of tragedy. Right. I don't think that anybody's destiny is there the hey thank god you're not this person i just think you get lucky you get lucky it's it's like a half court shot i i would say in a lot of wait well maybe it's not that it, it's it's do you think it's like partly luck and partly manifestation like if you really want something you're going to create the path for it and it can and it can go in many directions yeah, but I, I also feel like... And, and there's also tragedy, which is yeah. unavoidable and um, unpredictable. The tragedy of where you're born. Right. What you look like, what yeah. race you are, what part of the world you're in, like how lucky I was to be a white guy born in USA, you right. know what I mean? And yeah. how lucky I was to be born outside of Boston and had this crazy, insane scene. There's like a lot of like, you know, hurdles that were like this big. For, and even then, even then... Because of all the bullshit uh, that even does, even if you get that much of a head start, all of this other shit that can emotionally fuck you up can, um, you know. I mean, I, I think by the time I was like nine, uh, I, I, I had already just sort of like, I had that, yeah, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. I, don't, yeah, I just didn't give a shit. Like, and, but, and, and, but I did. You know what I mean? And then that's all your work to get back to that person who did care and did want stuff. You just, it's a defense mechanism. You're just like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. Oh, really? Is that going to happen? Oh, and then when I'm, that, that's supposed to what? Make me cry? Fuck you. Like I, I became that person, which is, uh, it's, it works as far as to get through that shit. 
but as far as getting anything that you fucking want in life, we have to be open and warm and, and attract stuff to you that you want. And you're over there with your, oh, yeah, I don't give a fuck. Fuck you. Really? Mm-hmm. 400 pounds in my chest? Put 500. I don't give a fuck doing that dumb guy shit. Um, yeah, there's like, yeah, it's just, yeah, that's the, that's the thing. When you're sitting there at, at fucking Boston Garden going, how the fuck, if I didn't meet this guy, if that guy didn't say that, if I went out that night and went with those people and did that, you just think of all of that fucking what if shit. And there's somebody who went out that night and went with those people. And then they're fucking sitting in a cubicle or a jail cell or in a fucking loveless marriage or something. And they're just it, like, why the, that, that, that's somebody's destiny to be in a loveless marriage. It's like, I just, I don't, um, yeah. And karma is another one I don't buy into. Mm-hmm. I think karma works if you, if you, if you believe in it. But what, what do you, how do you define karma? That basically, if you're a good person, good things happen to you. But if you're a bad person, no, that's not what karma is, though. But in my world, it is. But karma just <laughs> but like if you like karma simply means cause and effect. So okay, well, if you do good things, then no, it's not about good or bad. Jesus, it's just you, I feel like I'm in school again. No, no, but you do it. You can do I, it. Can you just give me the F and I'll go to summer school? <laughs> this F. <laughs> <laughs> no, like you, right. you, you, you do an action and it causes a result. Right. It's as simple as that. That's all karma means. <laughs> That's like uh, people, and people being a have, Satanist. People think that you believe in the devil and people who right. are just like uh, Satanism or whatever. They don't even believe in a, uh, a heaven or a hell or a devil. Right. It's just they just living for themselves. And everybody's like, oh, they're into the devil. So I always thought karma was like, if you're a fucking asshole, then bad shit happens to you. And then in my business, I'd watch these fucking people stealing and, and doing all this shit and just look at them and be like, well, you know. Good, you know, nothing's bad's happened to them. And I've done a bunch of bad shit. And like, overall, my life is good. But I, you know, I've heard a lot of people and shit. So no, and, and, and karma, so what is it? Then? It, it just, it just simply means that you do an action and it creates a result. So all these people are using that term incorrectly. Yes. I just put it in a script incorrectly. Well, episode it's, eight it's, of F but, is for family. Well, it's correct in that because <laughs> like a lot of people think that that's what it what it is. But like oh, okay. when you go to the roots of what karma is, it just simply means like you do an action and it's cause and effect. I saw somebody uh, somebody I follow on Instagram. They had a picture of a boomerang and it said karma on it. So that's actually wrong. Oh my God! I wish I knew the real definition. Then I could have been that pompous ass on the internet being like, actually, none of you guys. That's like one time I saw this guy talking about how he didn't have white privilege. And his idea that he didn't have white privilege is because he wasn't born rich and he had to work for the things that he had. So his idea is that white privilege just means you're born on a yacht and all of this fucking shit. It's like, no, that's not what that means. That means at no point were you with because of your you didn't just get pulled over for being white get the shit kicked out of you, you know, and, and all, all of these other things that would have happened to you. You just, you basically, because you had to work for things, you feel you're not privileged. So literally his definition was privilege. That's funny. <laughs> it was, I can't give you any more details of it. I'll tell you afterwards. Because all right. It's, how, it, how do you, how do you deal with like, um, internet trolley type people? Like, have you ever struggled with that or? Wanted to interact with people like that? Early on I did, but now I just, it has nothing to do with me. Yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do. The amount of shit that I hate that really just has to do with me and my day. Right. That I do, and other people do that too. I don't think I'm, you know, any different than they are, but like, um, yeah, I don't give a fuck. I don't, it'd have to be a, a specific thing that I did, and I thought it was bad too, and then everybody said, you shouldn't have done that, blah, 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 blah. Like, I don't know if I, I don't know what, I, I, but... If it's just like, uh, you know, you know, so much of whatever you post isn't about what you posted. It's about what's in the background. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. so, you could be, so you could do yeah, something yeah. great. Be, oh, my God, that's fucking great. But what's up with that, uh, that fucking picture on the wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laughing my ass off. Like, that's like, but what I learned after a while is like, that's their moment. Right. On the thread. Right. Like, I'm going to be the guy that notices the thing that starts. And then everybody's talking about what I wanted to talk about. And then it, it's this weird thing where you feel good. But like, I... I I do the same thing. If I send out a tweet and it gets a bunch of retweets and likes, I'm like, all right, people thought that was funny. So I'm just on the other end of it. So I just learned, like, I can't get upset that somebody is noticing something in this and now they're doing their little show. Like, who the fuck am I? It's like, you don't want someone to do that. Don't post something on there. 
And I just look at like, listen, you don't want people saying a bunch of bad shit about you. Don't put your face on the internet. It's like you're literally asking for it. You're sticking your chin out. Yeah. And they're winding up and punching you. And then you're acting like a victim. It's like, well, you fucking don't post shit. Just right. sit there like this. Or, you know, post it, take a few shots and uh, continue on, I guess. As a musician, like, I mean, well, firstly, like, as an instrumental musician, there's nothing anybody can say about, like, what I'm saying. I'm not expressing an opinion. I'm just playing notes, oh, right? Man. But then now I've just put out an album of songs with lyrics. And there's only been out I there for a while. I think be all right. No, what I'm saying is that in the context of a song, and I'm very much expressing, like, stories that are personal, but, like, to go out there as a comedian and, like, express really strong opinions, like, I can't imagine, like the difference in like the kind of feedback that you get. And I guess well, I'm curious. what people do is you have to understand that what they do is they don't like, I've always said this, like you can do 80 jokes in a row and someone will sit there laughing and enjoying your set. And then the 81st one has to do something about them. If it's a fat joke and they're fat, right, right. if it's about women and they're a woman or it's about this state and they're from there. And then all of a sudden, yeah, it's funny. It's, and, that, and they go, that statement you made, about fucking <laughs> Arkansas. And it's just like, no, 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 no. They were all, so they were all jokes except for the one. Right. You know what I mean? So there's, there's just that, um, you know, there's just that, that thing. I just, you, I don't pay it any mind. And um, yeah, if there was ever any sort of big dust up about something I said, if I actually looked at it and thought I said something wrong, I'd be like, all right, well, maybe I'll phrase it a different way. But like, I, I do think it's absolutely ridiculous that people get offended about a joke that was told at a show that they weren't at. And oh, because it's taken so out of context. And No, you weren't at the show. Yeah. And you chose to click on that thing. And the, here's another thing, too. If the comedian didn't film it and post it, yeah. if just some fucking asshole in the crowd did, get mad at them. Yeah. And it's just like, well, what the fuck are you doing? If you're this easily offended about stand-up comedy, what are you doing watching, watching stand-up yeah. comedy? The whole thing is so, like... I just saw, I think it was in Australia, like the first mammal went extinct due to glo uh, human global warming and barely, barely a word about it. But like all of this shit, uh, you know, fucking, you know, oh, it's more difficult to be a comedian if you're a woman. Uh, fucking me too. Uh, it's all about us and what we're going through and blah, 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 and all of this shit. And just meanwhile, all of that pales in comparison to, you know, if if this fucking place isn't here, you're not going to have to worry about any of that. Right. That's why I think that the cell phones are super destructive, like because they are making everything about me, me, me. Look what I'm doing. Look like where I am. Look what I'm eating. It's all and and we're <laughs> on it constantly. And it's like, well, did you see Chris D'Elia? You follow Did you see his thing that he did? The uh, the unfollowing? No. Oh, my God. It's one of my favorite things ever. He's talking about. <laughs> just making fun of Instagram models. Uh, I mean, I can do it. I don't feel like I'm doing his joke because he put it out there. He goes, look, he goes, if you're on Instagram, he goes, and you're posting stuff, you're just taking a picture of your booty and your titties. He goes, make no mistake. You're hooking. And he just starts calling them hookers. <laughs> And then, you know, and then he just starts really like some, some of these people I didn't even know fucking existed. I guess there's this thing that pretty girls do where they bite into a sandwich and they kind of look up like that. All right. Saying like, yeah, yeah, that I'm going to start this thing called the unfollowing. And what I love about it is, first of all, I'm seeing him turning the corner as a comedian because he was always just he just had that. This guy is a like a fucking closer, you know, and now He's getting, he's like finding his, like, like this razor because he was always kind of fun and energetic and stuff. And, but now it's, it's like, it's like, it's becoming this, you're seeing this force going in this direction. Like I was fucking crying, laughing, like I'm not very few things along those lines make me laugh. And it just really fucking was making me laugh. But the funniest thing about that is that would really bother somebody like that mm -hmm. where, where like because yeah. because they're living not that i would want to hurt those people because it's very easy to hate beautiful people <laughs> you know what i mean it just is they're very hateable as you're staring at them because you hate yourself like why am i this fucking obsessed 
with like this beauty and all of this stuff. Like, with, like, look at it. you got like, I got to fucking do nine hours of fucking specials to get half as many followings as you do because you wore a fucking half shirt, you know. <laughs> so I just there was just something funny to just finally see uh, a movement to make their numbers go down. I don't know. The more I'm saying this out loud, I'm actually realizing that it kind of says more about me than about those people that take those pictures. But it's, I don't know. I just thought it was, it. that shit is funny. So I'm actually watching that girl at the gas station. I'm going to try to take a, uh, like this morning, I didn't have my phone, uh, you know, and I spent the entire like two and a half hours I had with my daughter this morning, chased her around. We played with the puzzles. I read the books. Uh, what else did we do? was teaching her how to play catch. And uh, I think she's going to throw with the left hand, which would be really cool. Although she's really big with the Daryl Dawkins over-the-top sort of two-handed slam. I know you're not going to know that reference. He played for the 76ers before you were born. Um, so I'm trying to get her not to uh, be into stuff like that. But the weird thing is, is because they're so hyper with their energy and all you want to do is just hold them and hug them, the best way to do that is if you put on their favorite cartoon and then they, oh, they yeah, just totally yeah. snuggle up next yeah. to you. But then there's no interaction other than the physical. Because then you just, <laughs> you're literally saying like, hey, 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 you know, give me a kiss, give me a kiss. And they'll go like, they'll just sort of lean into you and not even look at you. Just give you the cheek and they just sort of lasered into that. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I watched a lot of TV. I did all right in life. What the fuck are you going to do? I wasn't so, even allowed to watch TV. Yeah, and look at you, look how fucking talented you are. And I'm up there just screaming and yelling like a <laughs> lunatic. Um, where can people get this album? Um, anywhere you listen to music. Um, can they download it on iTunes? Yeah. Spotify. I mean, you can't, right? I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a truer thing's going to be said on this podcast than that. Yeah, I can't because my fucking computer's filled up and I forget my password all the time. Well, I just want to... Uh, congratulate you because i know you worked so hard on this just assembling a band and all of that type of stuff like there's so much more work to this where i just like i need to write a new hour i don't have to find a mic stand guy and all of this <laughs> shit i just have to go out and just go do it but um I, whatever you did the three songs that i listened to i mean it is just it's on such a high level creativity and everything um, I'm, I'm really happy for you and, uh, everybody watching, listening, cause there are going to be some clips of this, uh, on video, please download. And it is called love remains, love remains. All right. Thank you for coming on. I was going to ask you, um, how do you stop doing ums and ahs and you knows and shit like that? How do I? Yeah. No, I don't. I, I do it all the you time. You do it all the time. Why? Cause like it's something that. Oh, cause you do it. I do it so much. Oh, I do it too. Oh, you do? And you don't care? No, I don't, I don't, give, a I don't give a fuck. Do you, you listen to uh, Keith Richards. Yeah, People can't understand him. He doesn't give a shit. But like, what about when you're doing material? I guess because you've written the material, there's going to be less of that because you know what you're about to say, as opposed to if you're just doing a podcast. If I was to actually try to work on something like that, then I would be up here, which is not where I want to be. Right, yeah. I yeah. want to be just... Coming down the rain spout and out my fucking mouth. But would mouth. that be like considered technique for a comedian to like at some point work on that? Yes, it would. Whereas like with like, um, I learned when I started uh, taking drum lessons from D Dave Elich, um, how many, like how much, you know, of the way I was playing was getting in the way of me getting to where I wanted to be with whatever, because my, my technique, I was like sitting like this and I was grabbing the sticks, like I was getting blisters and, and, uh, I, like I wasn't making gravity, anything that had to do with physics work for me. So I was literally fighting the drum kit. And then he taught me all of this stuff. I haven't seen him in a couple of months and I'm going back to my bad old habits, but, <laughs> um, there is that thing, I think, that like uh what we'll say with like a musician it's mm -hmm. like i don't want to learn how to read man i just want to you know i just want to fucking be this you know free fucking thing right and just there is merit in that because you do have those people who only can play if there's sheet music in front of them right but if you can somehow marry both of those where you actually have technique but you can still play from here yeah and not be up there i think that that's like the promised land and i always kind of felt is a comedian if you could somehow combine 
Richard Pryor that specially did live in concert on Long Beach, if you could combine that with George Carlin, um, where his stuff was just like, I feel like he, he knew every fucking word that he was going to say. And it was like, just like pop, 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 the whole time where prior, you know, on that special came walking out. It was like a hell gig. There was people walking around and shit. And he just started making fun of people. And I think the way he was wired, that helped him. That helped him better than if everyone was just sitting there staring at him like, OK, begin your your stand up special. I think that he came out and, you know, sit your ass down. You know, sit your fucking ugly ass down with all that stuff that he was saying. And everyone was just walking around. He's riffing. And then he just just got in a zone. And what's amazing, you know, is if you get into a zone, usually that will last for like six minutes. Because what happens after six minutes of that is you're like, you start worrying, going, well, what happens when this ends? And I have to go into my act. I'm going to be fucked. And... You, you can't think that because that, it's almost like when you, you ever try like meditating. Yeah. I so, meditate. you know, like when you start to feel like you're floating and like leaving your body, if you start thinking, oh, my God, this is great. I'm leaving. And then you, whoosh, yeah, you yeah, just go right, right back. back down. <laughs> so that's the same way with like, like catching a zone. So like what I've learned, the little I know about technique with like drums is you just practice a little bit every day. And then when it starts to become this thing you don't have to think about, then all those skills you learned about sort of leaving your body and just like, just like, I mean, your body's there, but you're, you're listening to what you're playing. That's making you do that next thing. If you can exist, you can go back there with all this technique. Now you're not going to get hurt. You're not going to get tired. Um, I mean, eventually will, but like, um, so I think with a comedian, if, if I was to try to do that, like, okay, maybe I won't curse as much or something like that. Like I, there would definitely be a, a few steps backwards. Um, but I think yeah, maybe it would help me. I don't know. I, I don't. I honestly don't think. I don't think. Okay, because if I go up there and I start doing that, it's, it's all about not being here. Hmm. Um, I mean, I saw, I'm obviously thinking like, okay, I'm gonna. It's more like okay, you. Like I just walk out. I just start talking, and then this joke comes out, and then I said this joke, which made me think, oh yeah, I have this joke, and look at this fucking guy. And then it just sort of just, oh, now we're over here. And just, you just. But do you have like a set list of jokes? Like you want to do it in this order or this order? Yeah. But that is all out the fucking window the second I go up there. Oh, yeah. And so, well, some nights it goes like that. And then other nights, like I definitely have like sections, but there's some nights I just go out there and all of a sudden I tell the last joke first and I'm switching everything around. And then the guy I tour with is just, you know, waiting to go on stage going like, dude, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. Or you did your closing bit in the middle. I was like, wait, he's only doing 35 minutes. And then you went on, you did like another, you know, whatever, another 25 after that or something. Um, I have like the main set list, you know, so that's the, you know, this is the plan, the general fucking plan. And then you go out there and shit happens you're in a weird mood. Somebody says something. You look at something in the back of the room that makes you think of something. And then it, go, it goes in that direction. And, um, and I am a full believer of doing that because mm-hmm. then it doesn't become this grind. Because I, yeah. I used to have, I start with this and then that leads to this. And I have my segues and blah, 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 blah. Right. And it just became like, you know. It's rigid. Yeah, and then I would be on stage, and my, my mouth would be talking, and I would find myself thinking about going like, well, the second show, if the headliner lets me not uh, close it out, I could probably be home by, and then I was just right, like, yeah. and then I was just like, wait, I'm talking right now, and people are laughing, and I'm thinking about other shit. What the fuck am I doing right now? And um, I had, uh, it's weird. I learned how to free myself up through wa- I, more through watching musicians I've always equated it to music because that's something that I, I sort of started with. So I always thought, I remember talking to a long time ago, late, great Patrice O'Neill, and I said, I was telling him, I was like, you know, I always wish I could see somebody because you couldn't gauge how good you were. You know, you can't see how good you are or how much you're improving because you're you. You know what I mean? You're, you're just in there. So I always said, I always wanted to, I wish I could just have somebody sit down and play guitar 
at the level of comic that I am right now. It's like, could they change chords? Could they play without looking? Could they solo? Like, where am I <laughs> on that trajectory? <laughs> and it was one of the few times he didn't give me any shit. He was just like, huh, he goes, that's actually interesting. Then probably I reacted to that, and then he probably trashed me because <laughs> he actually opened up for half a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Fascinating. The fascinating nuts and bolts of how to tell dick and shit jokes. We'll yep. continue after these messages from Stamps.com. And now for Bill Burr's theme song. Oh, I get a theme song out of this. I would have thought it would have been on like a ukulele, some sort of Irish jig song. Do they play ukuleles out there? I don't know. You have to play though. Seriously. I have to play? Yeah. Why do I have to play? Because I'm going to sing your theme song. Well, then you have to tell a joke. I have to tell a joke? Well, why do I have to do my hobby? Oh. Do you know what I mean? What am I playing? Dun, crack. Dun, dun, crack. I don't have any earplugs. My ears are fucking junk. Okay, so play it really softly. Play it really softly? Is that piano or forte? <laughs> hey, on, could you just, could you just do, make sure you do the retard? Huh? The retard? <laughs> yeah. I learned how. We're going to retard in the end. <laughs> All right, you ready? <laughs> yeah. All right. Bill Burr. Bill, Bill Burr. Bill Burr. Bill, Bill. <laughs> That's all I get? No, 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 I was gonna keep... Oh, I didn't know, okay. Oh, well, you the one that retarded. <laughs> what? It sounded so simple, I didn't think you were gonna keep... Bill Burr. Bill, Bill Burr. Bill Burr. <laughs> Let me see. I think it needs more. What if you went da 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 Yeah, so I'd be like, um, Welcome to Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to Bill Burr's... No, no. You have to get... Welcome to Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> oh, I gotta do that? Yeah. I can't, I can't, see, I can't so it'd be like, I'd, like, it's like, it's like triplets, like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> da, 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 see, that's da, how your brain works. My brain doesn't do that. Occasionally it'll do that, but not really. Yeah, see, this is why I became a comedian. <laughs> Here That's how it has to end. That's the retard. All right.